Welcome back to Invested, I'm Lockie, and today we'll get American Express, the luxury credit card giant. Looking at the stock's historical performance here, you can see from the lows of 2009, the stock has produced outstanding returns, rising over 1300% between 2009 and 2021. Despite this reasonable rate of return, there have been significant downturns in the stock during that period. For instance, between 2014 and 2016, the stock declined over 45%. And once again, in 2020, during the COVID-19 pullback, the stock dropped over 45% once again. On a five-year basis, although returns haven't been outstanding, the returns have been highly consistent. Between 2016 and 2019, the stock returned just over 86% for its investors. And following the massive drawdown in 2020, the stock has rocketed back up in price, rising over 140% from its lows in 2020. On a year-to-date basis, the stock is up over 47%. However, over the past month, the stock has declined over 7% in a recent pullback. So with a pullback of this kind, the question naturally becomes, is the stock overvalued? Is it time to buy? And can growth continue going forward? Today, I'm going to be breaking down the business for you, focusing on all the key factors. It's financial strengths, performance, growth, profitability, management, and they give you a current valuation and price target for the stock going forward, telling you if American Express is a buy, sell, or hold at this time. If you enjoy this type of content, then please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and let's get into it. Putting up our screen here, we're going to start off by assessing the financial strength of American Express. How financially strong is the company, and how likely is it that the company could endure a financial downturn going forward? Coming down here, we can see financial strength, and when assessing the financial strength of a business, there's really one key metric we focus on, and that's the cash to debt ratio. The cash the business currently has on hand to meet their short-term and long-term debt obligations outstanding. American Express's current cash to debt ratio is 0.75, indicating that for every dollar of debt the company has on hand, they have 75 cents to meet that debt. As far as a cash to debt ratio goes, this is fairly healthy for a company. It means if American Express so desired, they could pay down 75% of all the debt outstanding without having to turn to additional cash flows from operations to meet that debt obligation. When I look at American Express's business model and take into account the highly free cash flow generative nature of the model, where transaction revenues are constantly coming into the business, I'm highly, highly confident with this cash to debt ratio. 0.75 is more than healthy for me. And when you take into account the additional cash flows coming from operations, American Express appears to me to be an exceptionally strong financial position. The key factor investors must take into account when assessing the financial strength of American Express, however, is the credit risk being undertaken by the business. American Express is not only a credit card company, but also a bank holding company, meaning they're responsible for all the credit and all the debt undertaken by their cardholders. If American Express cardholders default on their debt, then American Express can be liable for that, the same way a bank would be liable if one was to default on their mortgage. So despite the highly free cash flow generative nature of the business and the healthy cash to debt ratio, the nature of American Express's business as a bank holding company, and thus the credit risk they undertake, severely increases the financial risk associated with the business. Investors and the market as a whole places a discount on companies that hold such credit risk because there is a massive, massive degree of downside potential associated with such business practices. So when assessing the financial strength of American Express beyond the basic metrics, that is a key, key factor to take into account. So moving on to profitability now, let's have a look at how profitable American Express is as a business. When assessing the profitability of a business, of course, there's two key things we focus on. Number one is the margins of the business, and number two is the returns on equity and returns on assets. Coming down here on a margins basis, you can see American Express has net margins of 19.33%. Although these margins aren't exceptionally high, it means for every dollar of revenue that American Express brings in, they retain about 19 cents in profit. For a business of this age and this maturity, net margins of around 20% appear healthy to me. They're nowhere near the margins associated with a company such as Visa or MasterCard, companies consistently posting margins from 40 to 50%, However, that is indicative of the differences in the two business models being utilized by the company. As mentioned before, American Express is not only responsible for the debt undertaken on each credit card, but also they have to physically issue every single credit card used by their holders. Visa and MasterCard don't have the same marginal costs. Firstly, Visa and MasterCard do not issue their own cards. They defer issuing responsibilities to the partner bank and thus don't incur the physical costs associated with card issuance. And secondly, Visa and MasterCard are simply payment clearing networks. They're not responsible for the debt undertaken on each of their cards. That responsibility, once again, falls to the partner bank. American Express's case, they're responsible for both the issuance of the cards and the debt obligations associated with each user. And thus their margins are significantly lower than their competing firms. Having a look at returns on equity and returns on assets down here, when assessing a business based on these two metrics, we tend to look for returns on equity and returns on assets around that 20% figure. Now on a returns on equity basis, American Express is doing exceptionally well. They have returns on equity of around 32.08%, signifying not only a fantastic business model, but also a high degree of management competency within the business. American Express's management are allocating their capital well to make decent returns on equity for shares. 
shareholders. The returns on assets figure, however, is well below where we would want it to be for a business of this size. Returns on assets of around 4.12% is likely less indicative of a business lacking quality, but rather a cyclical downturn in the returns on assets made by the business. American Express is naturally a company heavily associated with travel. These cards are prolifically used overseas, and thus when an event such as the COVID-19 pandemic occurs, less international travel occurs subsequently, and thus their cars are used less and less and less, and thus their returns on assets figure declines. This return of 4.12% is less about the quality of the business and more about the cyclicality and the current business environment the business finds itself in. So on a profitability basis, although net margins and returns on equity are reasonable, returns on assets really lets the firm down on a cyclical basis. It'll be highly interesting to see how these numbers change over the next one to two years to give an indication of how strong American Express's recovery from the pandemic can be, whether they continue to grow going forward, whether growth stagnates and the returns on assets remain low into the future. Coming down here to some basic valuation metrics for the company, we can see there's a lot of different ratios you can use to assess a business. You've got the PB ratio, PS ratio, PEG ratio, all these very, very fancy numbers. But when it comes to assessing a business using these basic financial metrics, there's really only one I use. And that's the PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio. And the current PE ratio for American Express is 18.13. Historically, this is about moderate for the company. You look at their median PE of the past 10 years, it's 15.22, and their minimum PE was 10.41. So based purely off the PE ratio, we could conclude that the business is about fairly, if not slightly overvalued at present. But we're going to get into a more detailed DC evaluation later on, showing you the cash flows of the business in detail. So keep watching for that one. Coming down to revenue and net income over here, we can see revenue and net income for the business have been fairly consistent between 2009 and 2021 with only moderate growth. Back in 2009, revenue was around 24,000 and net income of around 2,100. And now in 2020, you've got revenue of around 6,000 and net income of around 3,000. Of course, net income for the business has seen a substantial decline from 2019. 2019 figures were around 6,700. And thus the 2020 figure of around 3,100 has been more than cut in half since 2019. This is of course tied to the pandemic and the reduced in spending abroad. Coming over here on a cash to debt basis, you can see the cash to debt balance of the company has remained fairly consistent over time with American Express employing a lot of debt in their operations. Over the 10 year period between 2009 and 2019, the cash to debt balance for American Express had debt well in excess of their cash balance. However, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and a pullback in spending abroad using American Express cards, American Express has elected to change their financial strategy somewhat. They're now employing far more cash relative to their debt, a far more stable financial position, and meaning that if the pandemic does persist for any prolonged period of time, they have the cash to endure that financial downturn and perpetuate growth post-pandemic going forward. You can see returns on equity for the business, once more, are very symbolic of a mature and consistent company. Returns on equity have been around that 20% figure for the past 10 years, with modest declines in 2009, 2017, and 2020. Those three drawdowns are of course tied to periods at which American Express had less spending on their cards. These returns on equity figure are naturally tied to the performance of the stock. If you go back and have a look at the same periods on the stock chart, you'll see massive, massive declines during these periods of lower consumer spending and lower returns on equity. Taking a deeper look at American Express's margins here, you can see that same degree of cyclicality we saw within returns on equity. You can see margins around 2009 had a swift decline, with operating margins declining from around 15% to all the way down to 8%, and net margins declining from around 14% all the way down to 5%. Despite the massive declines in operating and net margins, gross margins remain fairly consistent. They say around 92% in 2005, and at the lows of 2008, they only declined to about 87.33%. Gross margins have continued to grow consistently over time, very impressive for a business of American Express's mature nature. Gross margins hit a high in 2017, around 95.44%, before a decline around 2019, and then a subsequent incline, all the way up to current gross margins, around 96.63%. Net margins and operating margins have been far more sporadic, with consistent margins between 2010 and 2017, but then facing sporadic upturns and downturns between 2018 and 2020, as spending on American Express cards varied during both the pandemic and the pullback in 2018. So if we wanted to accurately value American Express as a business, we'd have to run something called a DCF analysis, a discounted cash flow analysis. As Warren Buffett always says, the value of any business is the cash flow that it will return to its shareholders between now and Judgment Day. And that's what a DCF tells us. We're going to run a DCF on both an earnings per share basis and a free cash flow basis. To give you an idea of how much earnings the company is bringing in and how much of that is translating to free cash flow the company can actually use to grow going forward. So we're going to start off on an earnings per share basis. And if we come down here, we can see the earnings per share growth rate for the past 10, 5, and 1 year periods. Over the past 10 years, earnings per share growth has been around 4%, 5 years only 1.71%, and over the past one year, earnings per share has declined at about 52.8%, of course tied to the pandemic. So taking into account these extremely low growth figures, I don't think they're fairly indicative of what American Express will achieve in terms of growth going forward. I think the nature of American Express's business 
both as a travel oriented company and a bank holding company potentially liable for the debt of its card users, the company has been hit relatively hard by the pandemic. I can see a reasonable degree of potential growth for the company going forward as it rebounds from the pandemic and as it continues to utilize its extremely strong brand image. A reasonable growth rate for the company on an earnings per share basis going forward, I think would stand more around 8% rather than the 4% figure posted there. So we're going to utilize an 8% growth rate figure in our calculation going forward. So our 8% growth rate figure, a discount rate of 8%. 8% of course is the long run return of the stock market. And that's a fair rate at which to discount our cash flows going forward. So utilizing those two numbers there in conjunction with our earnings per share figure of 9.57, taken down here on a 12 month trailing basis, we come out to a fair value price target of 173.92 cents about exactly where American Express is trading at right now, indicating that American Express may be trading at a fair valuation at present, but that's on an earnings per share basis. Now let's have a look at a free cash flow basis to give you an idea of how much those earnings are actually translating to free cash flow American Express can use going forward. Free cash flow often gives us a more reasonable valuation of mature companies. So let's take a look. So if we come down here and have a look at the free cash flow growth rates over the past 10, five and one year, you can see they're even lower than the earnings per share growth rates. Over a 10 year period, we've got a growth rate of 3.9%, five years, negative 4%, and one year's negative 64.7%. As transaction fees associated with the company's cards rapidly declined, this had a severe impact on free cash flow translating on the balance sheet, and thus the exceptionally low growth rates for free cash flow of the past 10, five, and one year period. Going forward, of course, much in line with the earnings per share figures, I believe these numbers can recover post-pandemic, as more and more travel takes place, and American Express's cards are used more and more and more. However, given the existing maturity of American Express's business, I believe a lower growth rate, more in line with 5% rather than the 8% that we use for earnings per share, would be a more suitable growth rate for free cash flow going forward. So we're going to use that within our calculation. A 5% free cash flow growth rate, a discount rate of 8%, and a free cash flow figure of 14.551, taken down here off a 12 month trailing basis. So utilizing those three figures, we come up to a slightly higher price target of $214.77. Looking at that number, investors may feel it's indicative of a degree of undervaluation in American Express stock. This, I believe, isn't the case. Given the credit risks associated with American Express's business discussed earlier, I believe free cash flow is not an indicative valuation of the business. Given the credit risk undertaken by the business, the market naturally assigns a discount to the business. If we were to take a look at other similar companies that undertake a degree of financial risk, companies such as Capital One Financial or Credit Acceptance Corp, then we would again see a massive discrepancy between the earnings per share valuation and the free cash flow valuation. Running a DCF valuation is always going to give you a discounted price target with these financial firms, but that does not mean it is a fair and accurate valuation of the company. And thus I believe a fairer price target for American Express at present would be $173.92, in line with the earnings per share figure calculation we came out with. So that would be my current price target for American Express. I believe rebounding from the pandemic going forward, American Express can experience reasonable growth, but given the maturity and size of the business already, I doubt investors will see any degree of exponential growth going forward. This is the type of company for an investor looking to receive modest returns on their capital over time and progressively receive more and more cash back from their investment as American Express's management continually turns their focus to returning cash to shareholders rather than expanding business growth. So that was my brief yet somewhat detailed analysis of American Express stock. A business with decent financial strength, reasonable profitability, but the key thing investors must take into account when assessing the value of the business is the credit risk that American Express undertakes with each of its clients. Unlike competing firms, American Express is responsible for any credit defaults that occur on their cards. And thus a great degree of financial pressure is placed on the firm relative to rivals such as Visa and MasterCard. If you enjoyed this video, if helped you learn something more about the business you're thinking about buying, then please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already, if there's a business you want me to talk about in the next video, just comment down below and I'll see if I can get onto it. But until then, thank you and I'll see you in the next one.